All right, so the point of this lecture today is to sort of bridge the gap between Theater 317 and Theater 319. And so in doing that, what we're doing is uh, we're going to come up with a, a list of major modes of thinking. And these are both artistic modes of thought, but they're also cultural, political, everyday people modes of thought as well. Um, and so as we go through these different modes of thought and, and sort of ways of looking at the world, it's important to keep in mind that the next one that comes along doesn't replace the previous one. It just sort of gets layered in on top of it. So one of the primary modes of artistic expression we dealt with towards the end of 317 uh, is neoclassicism. And as we talked about before already in this class, we're talking about uh, neoclassicism obviously begins with the Italian Renaissance. It really reaches its peak with Renaissance France. Louis XIII, Louis XIV, and the 17th and 18th century Europe in general. Uh, the embrace of neoclassicism is based on a handful of key philosophies. Um, as you recall from 317, if the Romans and Greeks did it, then it must be good, so we're going to do it. Um, that's the whole root of the word, neoclassicism. And uh, so we get that very much reliance on the pre-existing philosophies of ancient Greece and Rome. There's a belief in neoclassical philosophy that the world that we see around us is rational, ordered, and hierarchical. And that's a really key concept because uh, this is something that we take for granted nowadays, that the world definitely has an order. But there are a whole lot of reasons to believe that maybe the world doesn't have an order and a structure and a hierarchy, and that maybe it's just dangerous and chaotic and a mess. The neoclassical ideal fought against that notion and said, no, 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 there is a natural, rational, order to the world, and it's our job to reflect that order in our own human actions. One of the big parts of that is that it's the job of humans to take control of any parts of nature that are not rational, ordered, and hierarchical. Uh, so when we talk about that way of looking at the world, there's a notion that humans can control things. You can, humans can put things in order, humans can civilize, order, and organize the world, and it is in fact our job to do so. When we talk about the neoclassical ideal in theater, there was a very controlling mindset in this regard as well. It is based fundamentally on rules, and the rules that we get in the neoclassical uh, uh, thinking about theater are based on Aristotle's poetics, which then the Romans took and made a little bit more rigid than the poetics, and then the neoclassicists took Aristotle and the Roman work and made it hard and fast rules. This is right this is wrong. And here are some of the examples of those things. Uh, the three neoclassical unities are dominant examples of the way in which uh, there is a right and wrong way to do theater. As you recall from uh, our previous lectures in 317, neoclassical unities dictate that your play must play take place in 24 hours within the world of the play, that it must take place in one location or any location you can reach within that 24-hour period, and it must have one plot line. Not multiple plot lines, none of this crazy, wild, Shakespearean interwoven stuff, but one singular plot line. Those are the three unities, the unity of time, place, and action. Additionally, the neoclassicists claimed that they were representing real life on stage. That was a process or a practice called verisimilitude. What they really more acknowledged that they were doing was they were representing ideal life on stage. So the neoclassical says, we're not going to show you life as it actually is in its mundane, some kind of nasty, everyday nature. We're going to show you something that represents idealized life. Here's the world more beautiful than it actually is. And when we talk about visual art, a lot of these philosophies and approaches to the world are very nicely and usefully expressed in terms of neoclassical visual art. When you look at neoclassicism, you always see this notion of human control over the natural world. There, there is a, a geometry and symmetry in a lot of neoclassical uh, architectural design and visual art. There's always a frequent hierarchy. You can tell what's more important than uh, uh, other things because it's emphasized or focused on in the uh, design. And again, what we're dealing with here is human control. As you recall, from 317, the best uh, visual example of this is the Castle of Versailles, uh, built during the French Renaissance, and this is a classic example of all of those neoclassical notions. If you take a look here at all of the repeating geometric patterns in the design, it's all clearly designed by humans. It's structured, it's ordered, it's very geometrical. Uh, and then we take a look at the gardens at Versailles, 
This is a great example of human control over nature. The little patterns are uh, cut into each of the green garden yard places. We have trees that are literally put in boxes. You can't talk about human control over nature more clearly than taking a tree and putting it in a box. If you look at the pond down there, it's clearly a man-made pond. It's got little uh, design features on the side of it that are sculpted and crafted. This is an intention to demonstrate that there is human control over nature. When we talk about order and structure and hierarchy here, this is the overview ground plan for Versailles. You can tell immediately what the most important thing is. It's on the right there. It's the palace. The palace has the most commanding view. It has the uh, primary place of visual prominence when you enter from the right side. Uh, and so there's a very clear hierarchy. This ground plan is also another great example of symmetry. Uh, you talk about geometry and order and structure in all things. Just take a look at the lines and the linear arrangement of every item on the grounds of Versailles. It's planned, it's ordered, it's structured, it's hierarchical. So that pretty well covers neoclassicism. The next major cultural political movement to come along is the Age of Enlightenment, which hangs on to a handful of neoclassical ideas, but brings a lot of very new and different things on board. The Age of Enlightenment takes place primarily during 18th century Europe and also uh, in America as well. So we're talking about the 1700s here. The major cultural context during this era then are the continuing move forward of the Industrial Revolution. We're in an era where science, technology, manufacturing, and industry is growing and growing and growing, and we're making uh, more and more things that more and more people can own. Uh, so there's a little bit of democratization of uh, consumer goods at this point. Whereas before the Industrial Revolution, you wouldn't be able to afford, say, uh, more than one dress because it costs so much to make a dress. Now, if we've got a factory cranking out that dress, the price of the dress goes down and more people can afford everyday sort of luxury items. And that notion that the Industrial Revolution creates a little bit more economic freedom and a little bit more reliance on science and technology is key here. The other aspect is the notion that the industrial, or that the, uh, um, in addition to the Industrial Revolution, the 1700s are an era of national revolutions. America and France overthrow monarchical governments, which, I mean, a monarchy is about as neoclassical as you can get. It is very structured, ordered, and hierarchical. And during the uh, 1700s, we have the American Revolution, 1776, and the French Revolution, slightly messier, 1789. In addition, there are a handful of other um, smaller revolutions and political changes in Europe that really move the world a little bit closer to democracy. We're not all the way there, there yet everywhere, certainly, um, but this is a move forward towards democracy and away from the sort of blind acceptance of monarchs. Uh, and that's a, that blind acceptance has really very much characterized a lot of the neoclassical ideal. The Age of Enlightenment thinkers had one key similarity to neoclassicism. They looked at the world and said there is a natural pre-existing law and universal order to the world. So nature has a plan, has a structure, and has an order. And that order is uh, something that is inherent, that is natural and pre-existing. Humans may come along and discover that nature, um, that order and structure, but it was already there beforehand. Uh, and so we'll talk in class on Monday about a couple possible examples of that belief in uh, natural law and universal order. There are some departures from neoclassicism, however, and this is one of the key ones here. The Age of Enlightenment people were much more interested in scientific conclusions drawn based on observations. The neoclassicists believed in seeing the world based on principle. And as one example of this, in the neoclassical era, the bodily humors were a key way of understanding why humans got sick and how humans felt the way they did on a daily basis. If you recall, the bodily humors is a, this is a pseudoscientific belief that inside every human being, there are four humors or liquids, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. And the balance of those four humors is what keeps you healthy, what keeps you uh, emotionally regulated and basically normal and sane and not sick and dying. All of that humor stuff is based purely on pre-existing principle. Somebody long ago made a wild speculation. You know what? I bet there are four liquids inside the human body that affect um, health and well-being. 
and they wrote this down. This was typically, this stuff comes from Greece and Rome. They wrote it down, and everybody else after that just believed it. They just accepted the principle. The Age of Enlightenment mentality shifts away from saying, oh, no, 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 we're not just going to accept that principle anymore. We're actually going to test it with specific observations. So, for example, there's a long-standing uh, principle of bleeding someone when they're sick because the theory is that their humors are out of balance, that they have too much blood in their system, and that particularly when somebody has a fever, you need to let blood out of them, and that'll calm things. That was the long-standing medical principle. An Age of Enlightenment person would make an observation about that and say, I, I would like to scientifically observe here that when you bleed people, it has no effect on their fever. In fact, it frequently makes them more sick. So we're a big shift here away from this principled notion of just doing things the way they've always been done and towards a much more scientific, rational process of observation and drawing conclusion. And so there we get that rational and scientific nature here. And the Age of Enlightenment really does start down the road towards being able to scientifically, rationally justify why we do things. And that's not just scientific. Um, there are all kinds of, in the Age of Enlightenment, thinkers. Um, and here we're talking about, for instance, Thomas Jefferson is a good example of this. But there are uh, Rousseau, there are a handful of other major philosophers of this era, people who say you can rationally justify democracy. There's, I can argue you into believing that democracy is the right, right way to run a country. It's just one example of rational thought here. And so the way we do this is through studying things, investigating whether or not the way we're doing things today works. If that investigation says, nope, it doesn't work, then we change it and we try to get, get better. Bookmark this Age of Enlightenment stuff in your brain, because when we get to modernism a little bit later, this is really the same sort of thing. It, 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 modernism draws right from the beginnings of uh, the Age of Enlightenment, and, and that sort of thread of thought can be carried pretty clearly through. One of the things we get in that neoclassical departure, based on this notion that, eh, no, we need to think about stuff and not just do stuff, you get a consistent assault on authority. Because what you, what you do is, anytime somebody tells you how things are done, you now have a new set of tools to actually analyze that and say, well, yes, you've told me how things are done. That's principle. I'm going to look at it with this scientific rational mode of observation and say, is that really the way things are done? Should it be done that way? Can we do it better? One of the things that results is instead of just accepting what the king tells you is right and wrong, you start thinking for yourself. The natural result of this is a push towards democracy and, um, as we mentioned earlier in the slide, more than a few national revolutions and overthrowing monarchy. It's worth noting that in the Age of Enlightenment, there is not, there is an Age of Enlightenment theater. There are plays that are written during this era, and we can recognize them for a number of reasons, but one of them is they stop caring about the neoclassical ideal. Not every country does this, not every culture, but you get rid of these neoclassical rules because they don't really fit theatrical storytelling. We get also, interestingly enough, significantly more middle-class and working-class subject matter. Because if we're in an era of democracy, then you, the average everyday Joe, you start to matter a little bit more. As opposed to if we're in a neoclassical mindset, the only reason you matter is because the king says you matter. Once we throw that neoclassical mindset out the window, now, yep, middle and working class people matter, and so we can, in the theater, start telling stories about middle and working class people. If you recall, she Stoops to Conquer was the last play we read in 317, and that play does a, a fair amount of this stuff. I wouldn't explicitly call it an Age of Enlightenment play. There aren't really Age of Enlightenment plays. There are plays that were written during the Age of Enlightenment, but the Age of Enlightenment is not an ism the way neoclassicism is. It's more of a broader cultural and political movement that swept over Europe and America. But nonetheless, I would say you could look at She Stoops to Conquer and say, I can see the influences of the Age of Enlightenment here. All right, our next step, our next little bit of business that we need to add. So we've got neoclassicism, which you're very familiar with, this Age of Enlightenment business. And the next sort of mode of thinking that gets layered on top of all of this is called Romanticism. This uh, develops in late 18th and early 19th century Europe and America. So again, as you can see, time-wise, we are definitely overlapping the Age of Enlightenment. The Romantics were really interesting people. A lot of their influences are still around today. They're just in places that we don't often see them. 
Um, the Romantics were clearly interested in rejecting a whole lot of traits of neoclassicism. They rejected neoclassicism's obsession with order, control, structure, and rules. The Romantics basically said, look, I don't need any fixed societal rules to keep me down and tell me what to do. I should do what I feel. I should do what's, what's best for me, rather than just simply accept what I'm told. They also rejected a handful of the Age of Enlightenment modes of thinking. The Age of Enlightenment people believed that the best way to find capital T truth, or the best way to understand life, the best way to understand the universe, was through intellectual pursuit. That's what the Age of Enlightenment people have said. They said, if you want to understand the world, you've got to study it in this intellectual way and make observations and scientific conclusions, and then you will study it. The Romantics said, nah, we don't really think that studying something in a great deal of depth actually gets you to, the, to an understanding in a sort of philosophical, metaphysical sense. It doesn't get you to an understanding of why things are the way they are. So we're rejecting this whole notion that intellect is the best way to seek out truth. We're also going to reject this notion of progress over perception. And what I mean by that is very simply, the Age of Enlightenment people said, look, we've got to move forward. However we're doing it today, it's got to be done better tomorrow in everything, in law, in politics, in science, in art, in everything. There's this notion that in the Age of Enlightenment that progress is the most important thing. The Romantics said, no, I don't think progress is necessarily the most important thing. Individual perception is the most important thing. The Romantics were very me, me, me in their thinking. And the, what they said was, look, I don't care about society's progress so much as I care about how I as an individual feel and how I as an individual see the world. So it's much more about your own individual perception than it is about moving on to uh, improve the greater whole. And that's the third bullet point here. The um, Age of Enlightenment people believe that your job as an individual was to be really smart and to be really accomplished and to put that intelligence and accomplishment into service for the larger whole, the greater good. An example of the ideal age of enlightenment individual would be the scientist who makes an amazing discovery that benefits everyone. Or the politician, like Thomas Jefferson, who writes a document, uh, the Declaration of Independence, that changes the world. Those are age of enlightenment models of an individual serving the whole. The Romantics, because again, they're very me, me, me people, said, no, 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 the individual should be about the individual. You should really serve yourself first and understand and know yourself before you do any of this other stuff. So, we talked about what they rejected. Now let's talk about the sort of five key philosophical elements that define Romanticism. One, Romantics believe that there is the existence in the universe of a higher truth, capital T, truth. That is, some force, some presence, some being, something out there that explains the meaning of life, that explains the reason of the universe, that is, it's not God, right? They're not religious people. But the Romantics are people who believe in sort of this power and life force and supernatural energy of some kind that could, in some way, explain the existence of the universe, the reason we live, all that, so all the sort of big, mushy philosophical questions. So the Romantics believe in the existence of a higher truth and a larger whole, but as you'll see from the slide there, they believe that holistic approach is unknowable. That is, you can try to reach truth and understanding, but you'll never quite get there. Uh, so there's this belief in the Romantic idea that there's this power and life force out there and we need to keep striving to understand it, but because we're human, we'll never totally get there. One of the ways we can get closer, though, is to maintain our natural, uncorrupted state. The Romantics are very much back-to-nature kind of people in that regard. They believe very strongly that human society has corrupted our true, easygoing, genuinely innocent, kind nature. That things like cities and factories and all, this other, uh, all the other trappings of a sort of modern Enlightenment society, they say that stuff has corrupted us. We got to go back to the way it was. We have to go back to nature and back to our original simplistic selves. Uh, so that notion of that nature is the best way of doing things and that, that we must not be corrupted by society, big deal with the uh, Romantics. One of the other things that supports all of this is the Romantics believe that every human existence has a dual nature of, on one hand, the body or the physical aspects of what it is to be human. On the other hand, the soul or the spiritual aspects. 
And the romantic's big point here is that the body and the soul are kind of at war. Um, the body and the physical nature is all that sort of the, the, the problematic nature of the meat of being human, right? The human body gets sick. The human body has desires that distract us from higher pursuits, you know, and, and the romantics almost want to say, look, if we could just ascend out of our bodies and into the clouds, they're kind of weirdos like that, we would be able to get in touch with that higher unknowable whole. We would be able to better understand our soul and our spiritual existence. But that is something that you can't quite get to as a human, you live in your body, so you can't ever quite get away from it. The romantics are a little frustrated by that. They also believe that intellect is not the superior form of knowledge, but rather art is the superior form of knowledge. And therefore, the ideal human being is not the scientist, is not the heroic politician who writes the Declaration of Independence. The ideal human being is the individual artistic genius who is creating amazing masterworks of beautiful, compelling art that bring us closer to that uh, elevated higher truth that remind us of the importance of the natural and corrupted state. That's the ideal human being, according to the romantics. When you come into class, let's take a minute and talk about who these romantics remind you of, because their cultural influence is pervasive throughout Western history. They're all over the place. Here's a good example of a uh, of a romantic work of painting right so here's visual art in terms of romanticism you got an individual being internally contemplative by walking alone in nature and and looking out on the vast wondrous majesty of nature this giant thing uh in the background there looks kind of like a ruined castle and uh the romantics love ruins because anytime nature comes back over and takes, you know, and sort of takes over something that man built, the romantics love that because they believe that nature and the uncorrupted state is the best possible thing. So here's a guy out on his own, looking at, thinking about the world, being internally contemplative and examining his soul, etc. Very romantic in nature. By the way, I want to stop for a minute and make sure that I make this very clear. Romanticism, the mode of thought has nothing to do with lowercase r romanticism. Being romantic, as in romantic love, is tangentially related to the romantics, but really for the purposes of what we're gonna talk about, those two things are totally unrelated. So if, for instance, you get a midterm uh, essay question, just as an example, that asks you about what romanticism is, please don't say that it has anything to do with romantic love or romance or anything in that regard. Okay, so we've got Wanderer Above the Sea of Fog, and then we also have, here's a great example of a romantic poem, William Blake's opening stanza of Auguries of Innocence. To see a world in a grain of sand, and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, and eternity in an hour. I mean, you cannot get more romantic than this. We are seeking to get in touch with that greater life force, that larger unknowable whole. We're using nature to do it. You can see a whole world in a grain of sand. You can see heaven in a wild flower. William Blake is one of the many romantic poets who really exemplifies this notion, uh, a lot of those major notions of romanticism. So romanticism in the theater, because there is quite a lot of romanticism in the theater, and you're very glad we're not reading it because it's not very good. It is, in a lot of different ways, um, very, oops, very anti-neoclassical. It is also something, it is a, a form of thought that emphasizes emotion over action. So when I talk about neoclassical, romantic theater is not structured. It doesn't need to be structured in that very rigid neoclassical ideal way. It doesn't respect the unities. It doesn't really do any of those neoclassical things. The romantics, in terms of writing plays, boy, they loved emotion. If you want to talk about painful, long, hyper-emotional monologues where main characters, usually men, usually romantic heroic men, talk about their internal feelings and how much they feel passionately about this, that, or the other for long, long, long stanzas, that's romanticism. There is action in romantic theater, but there's a lot of talking about how you feel. And so there's that emphasis of emotion over action. Our central romantic character is usually this noble, like I said, heavily emotional, tragic hero. And the, 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 the plot line is typically um, the idea that uh, that noble, emotional, tragic hero will suffer some wrong, will set out to attempt to right it, 
who'll typically write it and set the world uh, the way it should be, and then he usually dies at the end. Um, we almost always get that very clear, tragic ending for our romantic hero. But boy, he's a good guy, and boy, is he noble and forthright and emotionally in touch with himself and unafraid to speak about his feelings and all this other stuff. William Tell by Frederick Schiller is a great example of romanticism in the theater. Um, William Tell is uh, about our central figure, William Tell, the hero, who rebels against corrupt foreign aristocrats. And William Tell is a sort of man out of the forest, and he's this very inspirational leader kind of guy. Um, but he's also in touch with his own emotions and everything. It's, uh, it's very super cheesy. Um, the other one, which we're, is in your anthology, and thank God we're not going to read, is Ernani, uh, written by Victor Hugo in 1829. Our main character is an outcast Spanish rebel. He pursues his love. He spends the whole time seeking out his love and finding his, his person. And this is where that little bit of love and romanticism does come into some of this. They are united. They find each other. They are surrounded by the bad guys who hate them, and they decide to end things in this tragic suicide. So we get, again, that heroic, um, tragic ending, which a lot of romantic plays have. We get the notion uh, at the end of the play, it's sort of a, we can't be together in this life, but we'll be together in the next. And it's this very squishy thing about, yeah, let's go live in the wherever together and we'll, you know, leave our bodies behind and move on into this higher plane of being, yada, yada. Um, again, it's worth knowing about as a school of thought. Right now you're thinking, who... The romantics are wackos. I don't really see them in society. Trust me, they're everywhere, and we'll talk about them all semester. Romanticism is a huge influence on uh, a lot of Western cultural thinking. All right. The last step we need to take, then, is moving on from romanticism to the next thing that comes along, which is melodrama. Melodrama is not a school of thought, but a grouping of types of plays. And what I mean by that is... Romantic playwrights identified themselves as such. They were a school of thought. They were people who talked with each other and collaborated and said, we are the romantics, and here's what it means to be romantic, and when I write a romantic play, I want it to have these conditions and traits. And they did it on purpose. So romanticism was a school of thought. Melodrama was just a bunch of guys writing a bunch of plays that had, we sort of looked back historically and said, oh yeah, those have some similar traits. Got it. So historians group plays together and they say, look, these are some of the major traits of melodrama. So melodrama takes some stuff from romanticism and says, all right, that's good. We're going to keep it. Emotion over intellect is a huge part of melodrama. Melodrama seeks to make you feel first and to think later. And that's a huge romantic trait here. The romantics are very emotional and they do some intellectual exploration, but not so much. Melodrama heavily influence or heavily emphasizes emotion rather than intellect. Melodrama always has that central romantic hero figure. He dies less often, but eh, not quite. And this is the guy who's, you know, just an upstanding individual and someone we could love and admire and wish we could be, and sometimes has sort of superhuman traits, not like superheroes, but they're just so good you could hardly ever believe that anybody could be that good. Melodrama loves that romantic hero person. And again, that good person often comes to a bad ending because they make one tragic mistake or because the world is out to get them or whatever. So it keeps those things. It rejects a handful of romantic notions. Romanticism was all about emotion over action. Melodrama says, no, 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 forget it. We got to have action. Emotion's important, right? As you look up above, emotion is more important than intellect, but emotion is not more important than action. Melodrama is plot-driven and is frequently, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, very spectacle-driven as well. Lots of stuff happens in melodramas. Lots of events, fights, revelations, discoveries, chases, travels, journeys, all kinds of stuff, because you got to keep an audience interested. Melodrama rejects the vague spirituality of those squishy, after-world, or uh, uh, higher ethereal plane romantics. They say, no, 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 your vague spirituality doesn't really work here. We've got a better idea. I'll get to what that better idea is in a minute. So it adds a soundtrack. As you'll notice, the structure of the word, mellow, drama, music, drama. Um, so this is the beginning of the time when, well, opera had been doing this as well, when the music in a production tells you how to feel. And that's one of the best ways to emphasize um, emotion over intellect, which is 
you get a little underscore, you get the piano player, the orchestra, you know, in the corner playing undertone, underscoring music, you can really uh, uh, pump up the emotion of a given piece. It also added this individualistic acting style that would drive theater professionals nuts later. The best and biggest and most interesting thing you can be as a melodramatic heroic acting star is you can be interesting and individualistic and different. You can be bombastic and physical and draw attention to yourself and be the most compelling, interesting, and emotionally dynamic person on the stage. So really, melodrama does end up being all about that lead star actor uh, in a whole lot of different ways. Melodrama also brings in a whole lot of visual spectacle. Uh, and I'll show you some examples of this in the 19th century American theater lecture. But melodrama took all this industrial revolution technology and used it on stage stuff blows up. You get ridiculous chases. You get all kinds of visual stuff moving in and out. Scenes changing in amazing dramatic ways. Uh, melodrama is huge on visual spectacle. Um, Gunfights, sword fights, chases. Whatever it is, if it's visually interesting, you tend to find it in melodramas. Melodrama also adds comic relief. You get minor characters who come in and give you a couple laughs every now and then. Romanticism didn't do that at all. Romanticism was too damn serious to think about having comic relief. And this is the big key, especially in the 1700s, the 1800s, melodrama has an explicitly moral purpose. Melodramas teach a lesson. The good guys usually win or are proven outright. The bad guys usually lose or are discovered and are punished. So we get that clear Christian purpose, in seven, especially in the 1700s and 1800s. Melodrama always teaches a moral, and the moral is always Christianity is good. You should be more Christian and moral and righteous and upstanding. So it's always a, a very clear, clear, black and white, straightforward moral lesson. So what I want you to do for me uh, before our next class is think of some examples of places we see melodrama in American pop culture today. Because as a genre, the melodrama is alive and well. It is all over the place. So come in with some good examples to talk about that. Uh, so to review... Remember, neoclassicism is all about that structure order hierarchy. We get a king at the top and everybody else is under the king, very structured order hierarchical. We've got visual art that's geometric geometric. We're based on principle. We love the Greeks and Romans. If that's if they did it, then we need to do it. The Age of Enlightenment comes along and complicates that by saying, no, 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 we need structure and order. Those are good, great. But we need more attention to individual will. You as the individual matters. Uh, you matter as the individual, and we need some more of this focus on rational and original thought, scientific thought, philosophical thought. Rather than just doing what the Greeks and Romans did, we need to come up with new ideas and justify them through rationality and scientific investigation. The Romantics believe that the human should best be found in his or her natural state, uncorrupted by society. They believe that the best form of, of, of humanity is the individual artistic genius, they love emotion. They do not really like the structure and order of society because it keeps them down. It represses their individual genius and interior state. Melodrama loves emotion, loves individual heroics and people who do wonderful, amazing, heroic, super, almost superhuman things. And melodrama always teaches us simple moral lessons. All right, that's the lecture. You are now uh, prepared to move forward into the world of 19th century America, which we'll get into for Monday.